morning, everyone. My name is Coretta Harris, and I'm president of Women in Philanthropy, and I'd like to welcome the members and guests to our spring program and our member meeting. Um, today we'll be starting with our exciting program, and then we'll move into our member meeting, which is open to all members. This will be followed by lunch um, with box, lunch, box lunches available. You're encouraged to stay and eat here at tables, but welcome to leave if you need to and take lunch with you. Our program portion um, for today's gathering is um, with our athletic director. Uh, one of the great pleasures of Women in Philanthropy is introducing members to a wide variety of people and programs at UCLA. Today we are highlighting an area of the university that many of us enjoy and support, UCLA athletics. We are very fortunate at UCLA to have exceptional teams I'll say that again. We're very fortunate at UCLA to have exceptional teams in both men's and women's sports. This year has been particularly good. This year has been a particularly good one for athletic teams. As you may have heard, and if you haven't, you'll hear it here first, men's volleyball just won the national championship on Saturday. the university's 121st championship, and beach volleyball played for the national title on Sunday against, against USC. Now, the outcome wasn't what we had hoped. We had an exceptional year of athletics. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an incredible meet, and we still have more national championships than USC. In addition, women's soccer finished the year ranked number one. Softball is currently ranked number two. Women's water polo and men's water polo are number three. Gymnastics finished the year at five. Men's basketball, number eight. And women's basketball at number th 13. And um, I'll just reiterate, if you haven't heard, we have very, very good men and women's sports yeah. program. <laughs> Check, check. Go. Those are certainly impressive numbers, and you'll notice how many women's sports are represented in those high rankings. There are also many interesting developments on the horizon with the transition from the Pac-12 to the Big Ten, implementation of name, image, and likeness practices, and maintaining these impressive rankings. To celebrate these extraordinary accomplishments and share more about the happenings in athletics, we are very fortunate to have with us Martin Jarman, the Alice and Nahum Lanier Family Director of Athletics for UCLA. Thank you. Martin has brought an incredible new energy to the athletic department since he was hired on May 19th 2023 <laughs> as the ninth athletic director in school history. He has made an immediate impact, which we'll let him tell us about. But I'd like to share a little bit more about him first. Martin came to UCLA from Boston College, where he served as the school's director of athletics for three years. Prior to joining Boston College in, in 2017 and becoming the youngest athletic director of any Power Five institution, at age 37, Martin served as Deputy, Deputy Director of Athletics at Ohio State, moving up the ranks after arriving as an Associate Athletic Director for Development in 2009. He was also Assistant Athletic Director for Development for seven years at Michigan State, where he served on the Athletic Director's Executive Leadership Team. A, na a native of Fayetteville, North Carolina, Jarman earned a bachelor's degree in communication study from the U University of North Carolina at Wilmington. A two-year captain of the men's basketball team, Martin led the team to the program's first ever NCAA tournament appearance in 2000 and earned Colonial Athletic Association All-Academic Honors in 2001. He holds both an MBA and a master's in sports administration from Ohio University. 
Martin is married to Dr. Jessica, sorry. Martin is married to Dr. Jessica Jarman, a dentist. They have three daughters, Scarlett, Savannah, and Serena. We are so pleased and fortunate to have UCLA Athletic Director Martin Jarman with us today. There will be time after his presentation for audience questions. With that, thank you, Martin, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Coretta. Thank you, Coretta, for that lovely introduction. Hello, how we doing? All right, I need everybody to stand up. Okay, and this is what I need you to do. I like starting my day with movement, right? It gets your energy going. I like yoga, so I want everybody to stand up and do a yoga pose. Okay? I want everybody to stand up. You can do whatever pose you want. There you go. There's, there's tree, that's right. There's this. Okay? Let me see. I want to see everybody do one. You can do like this if you want. All right, yep, you can do like that. Oh my goodness, Vicky. Wow. Yes. Let's get Vicky here. Go ahead, Vicky. <laughs> All right, I like the poses. I like that one. That's right. There we go. Got to stretch it out. Got to stretch it out. All right. <clears throat> Vicky, we're good. Oh, downward dog. Downward facing dog. Breathe. <sighs> Through the nose. <sighs> out with the mouth. How are we doing today? How are we doing today? All right, before I get started, if you, first of all, thank you for your support of UCLA. A round of applause for you for supporting UCLA. Now, if you support athletics, raise your hand. No, stand up. Stand up if you support athletics. Stand up. Mark, you? I want to hear, like, what, what, rabid dogs. What, what, Listen to the support right there. Rabbit, Vicky's rabbit. Thank you for supporting athletics. And everybody that's not standing up, if I'm so nicely invited next year, I want everybody standing up. I want everybody standing up. Thank you. Thank you so much. The three favorite words of a fundraiser it's never enough. Okay? It's never enough. I need more. You got to give me more. All right. So, um, thank you for having me. Uh, I am excited. Uh, May 19th will be three years. That's crazy uh, in the, in the uh, intro. <laughs> I started during COVID, so it kind of, I've never spent time with, with your group and a lot of groups, and I'm starting to do those things this year, uh, which is really fun. I was at Anderson School of Management last night talking to a class of about 70 students, and um, I don't know, it's, it's really cool. The energy that we have on campus is very lively. So I would love for you to ask questions during. Uh, this is not a lecture. I don't have my doctorate, so I'm not going to teach you anything today. Maybe educate, but not teach. Uh, so please interrupt me if you have any questions, any thoughts. I know we're going to have a question, a Q&A afterwards. Uh, that makes these go a little, little better, OK? Um, let's see, what else? Any other housekeeping? Let me, Taylor, thanks for being here. Taylor, everybody, uh, does a great job for us in, in development. Um, so um, athletics. 121 national championships, men's volleyball captured that. Uh, the last one on Saturday, uh, we're excited about that. We have 25 programs, 700 student athletes. Uh, we have a 94% graduation, no, 92% graduation rate, uh, which is one of the highest in the country. That is the thing we are most proud of. Uh, because when we attract student athletes, uh, they come here number one to get a great degree from the number one public institution in the country. That's a round of applause right there, because that's everybody here. Uh, Vicki. Uh, on the graduation rate, mm -hmm. uh, is there a difference between the women and the men? Are the women higher? <laughs> you know, so since I'm in a room full of females, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> I'm going to say yes, Vicki. Of course, Vicki would ask that. I love Vicki. 
Um, so, but it's very high, that's, that's what we're most proud of. We do two things in athletics. We recruit talent and we develop talent. That is what we do. Student athletes, that is who we serve. Uh, we have a lot of constituents, but that's what we keep the focus on. Um, when I came here to UCLA, uh, during the interview process, which I did over Zoom, two Zooms, um, I thought about UCLA and like, what does UCLA mean to me? And the word that came to mind was elite. UCLA is elite. It's elite athletically, highest level of competition. It's also elite academically. Great degree. There are not many places in the country that have that kind of um, both tenets. And so elite is the word, and then I wanted to have something um, that, that resonated with me, but would also resonate with our staff. We have 275 uh, teammates. Uh, employees in athletic department, 25 programs, 700 student athletes, elite. Elite stands for energy, leadership, integrity, toughness, excellence. That is elite. Energy, you gotta have passion and juice and energy to serve student athletes and to serve the many people. You gotta have juice, let's go, let's go. Who wants to be around someone that's kinda like this? And good morning, Devin, how are you? Yeah. I want juice, I want juice, I want juice, let's go, right? Um, so that's energy, gotta have passion. <clears throat> Excuse me, leadership. Leadership, you can't lead others unless you can lead yourself first. For me, that's what do I need to do to bring the best version of myself to, to, to campus every day? You know, for me, it's movement in the morning, working out, doing something. Gotta lead yourself. Um, integrity, here at UCLA Athletics, we don't cut corners. We're gonna do it one way and that's the right way. That's non-negotiable. Uh, toughness, I believe 90% of success is holding on when others let go of that rope. It is hard to win. We're in a competitive environment. The coaches that work in this department, they all have a scoreboard. You know, a lot of us have jobs that you don't know. There's, there's no kind of metric as far as how well you're doing. Coaches know, programs know. You win or you lose. You gotta have toughness. You gotta see the highs, men's volleyball winning, the, the crushing defeats. Beach volleyball losing 3-2 to, to SC, okay? Through it all, you've got to maintain and have a level of toughness and grit. Julie. And, and if you could say your name when you ask a question. I know Julie, so I'm. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> yes, no, that's good. I can drink some of my tea. All righty. Is working now? Okay. Whenever a microphone, I want to sing, but I'll spare you that. But Martin, I'm just curious. On Sunday, I was watching that heartbreaking loss. What, what do you say when you walk in and to, the, to those women and the coaches after something like that happens? So I'll tell you right. exactly what I said. So we were all together, there were a lot of tears. The head coach, Stein, said a few words. One of the captains said a few words. Uh, Jenny Johnson Jordan, who's assistant coach, said a few words. Then one or two other student athletes talked about the team. And then I asked Stein, I said, can I, can I say something? He said, yes. And I said, I am incredibly proud of you. You went down to nothing, and you fought back to tie it with a chance to win at the end. It is all about the effort that you demonstrated that makes Bruin Nation and all of us proud. You fought, and sometimes in life, it doesn't go your way. That's ball, but that's also life. I said the most important thing is the bonds you have with the women around you. Look around. These are your sisters for life. You had an unbelievable season, 40 wins, the most in the country. Do not let one play today or one match define how you view this team or yourself. You did a tremendous job. Doesn't always go our way. That's ball, that's life. But I am so proud of you. Bruin Nation is so proud of you. Make sure you connect appreciate each other because the bonds that you formed this season, this is the last time this team will be together. That is what matters. That's what I said. And then you said we still have more national championships. <laughs> no, 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 you, you know, those are always tough moments because they're seniors there, so that's the last time they're putting on that jersey. And then they're freshmen there that are like, oh, we get here, every, you know, I'll get here again. So I've, I've been there, I, I played college basketball, so I remember as a freshman losing the championship game and thinking, Oh, this is fine. I'm going to get here three more years where seniors right beside me are devastated, you know? So, 
But that's what I said. Proud of the effort. You fought. Uh, so that's elite. It's a mindset every day. It's not wins and losses. Elite is a mindset that we have. Um, so we're incredibly proud of, of all of our athletic programs. Um, Coretta mentioned we have a big, exciting transition uh, that's going to happen on August 2nd, 2024. Oh, you have a question? Do you have a question? Oh, OK. Uh, August 2nd, 2024, we're joining the Big Ten Conference. And uh, that's a move that, that we made uh, this past year. And um, it's going to be huge. It's going to be, to me, I think it's going to be transformational for our athletic program. And uh, it starts at the top. Gene Block, our chancellor, um, when he made the decision uh, in the best interest of our student athletes to be able to resource them and give them the exposure and the competitive landscape to, to be successful, um, that was huge for our athletic program. So we've got one more year in the Pac-12, and uh, we're going to try to win everything we play <laughs> and go out on top. Uh, but also, we're doing a strategic planning process right now to assess where we are in relation to our Big Ten counterparts. What are the areas that we need to strengthen? What are the areas that we have assets that we need to lean into? And we should finish that strategic planning process probably in the next month, and hopefully in August we'll have something that we can present to our campus administration and publicly to say, this is who we are, but this is where we're going. And the, 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 the thing that you have to remember, college athletics is in a chaotic time right now. Uh, and again, I, if you're familiar with it, let me know. I'm going to try to break a few things down. So college athletics, the two things that have happened, that if they happened by itself, it would still be very chaotic, but because they happen at the same time, makes it even more chaotic. The first one is uh, the transfer portal. OK? So the transfer portal, before two years ago, if you transferred to another institution, you had to have a year in residence, meaning you, you transferred, but you had to sit out a year. So it really was um, a deterrent for people transferring. So you knew, as a coach, you had roster continuity. Now you can transfer. And you can immediately be eligible. Well, what does that mean? That means it's harder than ever to keep talented student athletes from other schools poaching. Also, it's harder to have that continuity of roster management. This past year, LSU women's basketball won the national championship. They had one returning player on that team, or two. Think about that. They won a national championship with one to two returning players. Everybody else had transferred in. So, and you know, as industry goes, when you see success in a certain model, people try to copycat and emulate. So, so that's, that's been a big time transition. That's a good thing. Student athletes should be able to play immediately when they transfer. But it's also the unintended consequences that you have to deal with with your roster. Second one is name, image, and likeness, NIL, game changer. Prior to a year and a half ago, uh, student athletes could not make money um, off their name, image, and likeness. Now they can. So they can do deals with companies, uh, alumni, fans, uh, for services, and they get paid money. 95% of it is great. It's great. It's been awesome to see. Some of our student athletes now are getting into contracts and, and doing business uh, and learning things. Uh, and we've gotten some great collaboration and partnership. We've partnered with the UCLA Law School. So we have some 3L students once a week that do a clinic. So if any student athlete gets a contract or a deal, they can go to the, the law clinic. And the 3L students, along with two professors, give them counsel for free. Great partnership. And that's one of the things that we try to do more since I've been here is, is really bring athletics closer to campus and have more collaboration. I'm looking at Julie. We've been collaborating with Alumni Association, but doing more. We have so much talent on this campus. We have to tap into it more. You know, that's, that's, that's our charge at athletics. So, so we do that with the law school, Anderson School of Management. Um, can, does some consulting for our student athletes to talk about their brand, the decisions they make, what makes sense for them. And so that's been great. Uh, we also created a Westwood Exchange platform, platform where student athletes come on, Businesses and companies come on. They can do the deal right there. We can print out the 1099 for them, but also we have a documented deal so we know what our student athletes are getting. So, oh, question, Coretta. So with NIL, could you give a couple of examples where athletes have given back to the university without necessarily naming the names of the athletes or the sports that they participated in? 
For you mean like if they get an NIL deal? That they actually give it back dollars to the university. Has, uh, do we have any examples of that? Mm, no, we don't have examples of that. We've had some student athletes that. Um, I'll, I'll give an example. Kiki Rice is on our women's basketball team. She has an NIL deal with Jordan Brand with Nike, and uh, she gifted all of the student athletes on the women's basketball team this past year a pair of Jordans. You know, so that was cool. We have some student athletes that work in the community and give some of their dollars to to uh, nonprofits, not necessarily UCLA, but nonprofits. So that is happening. Uh, so 95% of it is great. It's awesome. I'd rather student athletes do deals and learn and make mistakes here in Westwood before they get out in the real world and, and get into bad deals and it's, and it's something we can't help you. There's a 5% of NIL that's not good. And NIL was never meant to be used as an inducement. What do I mean? You know, if, you, if we have student athletes that are talented, other schools are not allowed by rule, NCAA rule, to say, hey, Carol, if you come to X school, we'll pay you $20,000. That is against the rules. That is not supposed to be how NIL works. You're supposed to provide a service. You get paid for that. There's some that are doing, if you come to our school, we will give you this amount of money. And at UCLA, we're going to do it the right way. We don't do it that way. They're collectives. There's outside groups called collectives that, that actually organize from alumni and donors that provide these funds for student athletes. Some of them are in the up and up. Some of them are not. But again, remember, I said we're in the business of two things, talent acquisition and talent, talent development. Now we're actually into talent retention, too, because you have to keep your student athletes. So that's the hard part about NIL, and the NCAA really hasn't done much as far as punish any bad actors. So it's a wild, wild west. Anytime you start something new anyhow, it's a, really, it's a challenge. Um, but that's, that's kind of what we're, we're, we're going through. So, that's a, so those two things, transfer portal, NIL, conference realignment, chaotic time. And that's coming out of the pandemic where we couldn't have fans, which really severely impacted our, our financials uh, as far as ticket sales. So, those are some of the challenges that, that we have. Um, but that said, I'm excited about our future. You know, we won two national championships this year. Women's soccer won in, in November, and men's volleyball. Um, football and men's basketball, they probably generate, I would say, in the neighborhood of 90% of the revenue that athletics receives. So part of the focus on football and men's basketball is a business decision to help the other 23 sports do what they do. So we all need football and men's basketball particularly to be successful. And I would say both of those programs have been going just like this. Men's basketball has gone an upward trajectory, went to the Final Four two years ago, Sweet 16 this year. If we wouldn't have had the injury bug, we might have been favored to, to win a national championship. And uh, women's basketball on the up and up, Corey does a great job with the program, talented student athletes, and they're knocking on the door. And you're going to keep seeing it go like this. Uh, and in football, we won nine games this past year. Most we've won since 2014. Um, have, have a great staff, really talented young men. And um, you know, we won eight games, nine games. So, so it's kind of the trajectories up. So I feel good about those programs and the leadership. And um, you know, sky's the limit. So, so we're excited about that, excited about going to Big Ten. I'm going to stop right here if anybody has any questions. I, I see some. Yep, I knew it. I, I, I can feel it. I can feel the questions coming. I'm What's your name? Hi, I'm Kathleen Flanagan, um, Michigan State alum. On the banks of the yes. Red Sea. Ah. I worked at Michigan State. My wife's a Michigan State grad. My in-laws are Michigan State grads. So that's, oh, that's why I know that's that. That's great. <laughs> uh, how do you think the portal and the NIL will affect graduation rates, given you mentioned, I think, 92%, mm -hmm. which is fabulous. Any projections or thoughts about that issue? Yeah, well, the first one is it's too early to tell. Um, you know, do I think that it will impact some? Yes, but I would say, you know, the sports that's going to impact the most are probably football, um, men's basketball, you know, the sports that have a professional that you can go on and, and make your living. Whereas some of the other Olympic sports, you don't have that, you know, it, it, do, it doesn't behoove you to leave early to go because a professional 
ranks aren't there in the sport. So I would say I don't think it's going to move significantly. Uh, I think it's something that you're going to have to bolster your academic resources, uh, particularly tutors and academic counselors, to make sure the student athletes in the transition, you know, because there's a transition cost, right? When you go from one school to another, culturally you're trying to fit in, you got to make sure you keep up with your work and you're, you're in a different program with a different coach and different expectations. You know, you're going to have to have a team that helps young men and young women kind of navigate that. So I don't think it's going to change the graduation rate that much. I do think it's going to change how much we have to invest in their success holistically, not just in the classroom, but, but transition also. Liz and then Dorothy. Uh, I have a question. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm Liz Whitney. For any, I, I'm, I think this is my first time I'm coming. <laughs> Welcome, Liz. I, I live in New York, so I just have to. From New York, yeah. welcome. So uh, Martin was my big attraction to stay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I have a question. I know we lose athletes, promising athletes, who can then go on and, and earn, you know, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But how many, I know Troy Aikman came back and got his degree. Do we have very many of those athletes that leave for professional reasons and then come back and take advantage of getting a degree from this school? And is, there, is it covered? Yes, a great question. <laughs> you leave professionally. Um, do we have many athletes? I don't have a percentage. We have some. We have some. Uh, but the ones that do, usually they do it over a period of time. Like I think Russell Westbrook, for example, you know, he left after his second year, I want to say. So he, he's taking classes when he can. So, you know, he's on track to graduate at some point. So we do have student athletes that, that utilize this, and we do pay for it. Now, five to seven years ago, that wasn't the case. But because in the last few years we're doing more to enhance the student athlete experience, that's something that if you leave here and you are on scholarship um, and you want to come back, we will help you. We will pay for, you know, the books and things like that to help you graduate. That's something that we do. We're proud of that. We wish every one of our student athletes would, would utilize that. Um, but we have a pretty, we pretty, have a pretty high rate. But, but I would say a good number of them, probably not the majority, but a good number of them do come back eventually. Um, I don't know if anybody knows Ray Allen, uh, the NBA basketball player with the Celtics and the Heat. He just graduated last weekend from UConn, and he left UConn in 1997. Oh. But he just got his degree from UConn. He has teenage kids, has teenage kids yeah. So, so it does happen, and that's something that we, we try to promote a little more, uh, especially when we know kids are leaving. So when, we, when Amari Bailey is, is leaving, you know, and he's got one year here, we have conversations about, look, I know you're not thinking about it right now, but this is something that's going to be important to you when the ball stops. And we got you. You know, you're a Bruin, once a Bruin, always a Bruin. And we encourage that. But you know, when they leave, they're, they're so focused on their profession and getting started. Dorothy. Yes. What did you do to your wrist? Something <laughs> dumb. Something I dumb, Dorothy. <laughs> Going up the stairs with two foot loaded, both hands, you should never, never, oh, never do that. Those pesky stairs. <laughs> I know. OK. I am a graduate of the University of Cincinnati Bachelors and Ohio State. Masters. Okay. I am a passionate, passionate UCLA basketball fan. And what happened, um, this is going to be our 61st, per, 61st year of my husband and I coming to as many of the home games as possible. Wow. I have a question. As the year goes on, we make, it, make sure to get here a little early because I like to watch the players uh, my husband does too, but I, I'm the one that's. You know, <laughs> ah, Dorothy, you like to look at the guys. Yeah, I like to watch the guys. Dorothy like looking at the guys. Well, I always have a favorite guy each year. But <laughs> this year I've got three, mm. and I'm worrying because th they should have won the national championship. And I know what you said, and I'm sure you cheered them up when they had to. And they were finished after what one, two games. I'm looking at next year. And I want UCLA Bruins to have a phenomenal basketball year. We're losing Jalen Clark, 
we're losing Jaime, I, I'm assuming. Potentially, Jalen. Jalen has till the end of the month to decide if he's coming back or staying in the NBA. Okay. I heard that one. Jaime Jaquez. He's leaving. And Tiger. My favorite. You knew what I was going to say. I knew you were going to say Tiger Campbell. Campbell. We all love Tiger. <laughs> yeah. He's leaving, yes. So knowing that all of this is happening, do you know how Coach Cronin is going with the recruiting for next year? Yes. So I met with, with Mick a week and a half ago for about two hours. We talked about recruiting strategy. Um, it's going well. Some of it depends on decisions. So, for example, you know, you, you can't – we don't have any scholarships right now available. If Jalen were to leave, then there's a scholarship. If he doesn't, you know, so there's, it's, a, it's a numbers game. And also, too, the transfer portal is still open. So student athletes could decide to, to leave UCLA, and then you'd have a – uh, a spot open. So it's all in flux for the month of May. The good thing is it should be figured out by the end of the month. Um, or, you know, who's, who's coming back for sure. That should be figured out as far as NBA decisions. Recruiting is going well. We've signed a young man, a transfer from Utah, um, who was a sophomore at Utah, I believe. How tall? 6'5". 6'5". Um, European can do a little bit of, of, of a lot. And then I think we have two or three high school student athletes that have, that have signed. Um, th here's the thing. I trust Mick Cronin. You know, I trust Mick Cronin. Um, our, our, all our head coaches are like CEOs. You have to, you have to trust in their ability to, to do their job and do it excellently, right? And so... Um, I would tell you, you know, what Mick, what Mick and I have talked about, we all want to win a national championship, right? But realistically, you're not going to win a national championship every year. What Mick and I have talked about is we both want a basketball program that has a chance to win it every year. That's the key. You've got, to have, you've got to have a chance to win it every year. To me, and this is my opinion, in basketball, you've got to be like top eight, top ten. If you're a top ten program, you have a chance to cut down the nets. And so what we try to do is, is, is work together on how do we best position to where we can attract the talent that we need and also keep the veteran talent and have that mix to where we're a perennial top eight, top ten team to where you have a chance every year. I trust Mick Cronin. I think he is hungry. You know, that's, that's like there's three things I hire when I look for, for head coaches. The first one is integrity. I got to be able to sleep. My boss has got to be able to sleep good knowing that you're going to do things right. The second one is hunger. I want somebody hungry, because when you're hungry, you figure things out. When problems come, you figure it out. And the third one is, is a passion for teaching. You're, we're educators. Mick has all those components. He has all those aspects. He's hungry. He wants to bring number 12 here. And so I would tell you, trust them. You know, I know everybody reads stuff and everything. Just trust them, and, and I think we'll be good. Well, thank you for that. And I have to, I have to say something about it. <laughs> <clears throat> Corey Close. Corey spoke for one, yes. Corey spoke for one of our women's philanthropy meetings. I was very impressed with her. And other things that I'm involved in, in the community, I chair a program where I bring a, a speaker. And I thought, well, I don't know if, she, I loved hearing her. And I, I was fascinated with how she feels about the team, both learning their skills and as people. I, mm -hmm. It really was impressive. So I, I followed up afterward, and I asked her if she would come and speak to my, to my group. And, of course, she came, and it was at her house. Kiki Rice was practicing there and with, uh, with uh, an agent that was, you know, playing in the, in the uh, yard. And I, and I really was impressed. When she spoke, I realized my allegiance truly is to the – men's basketball team. But this lady is really terrific. <laughs> <laughs> no, this lady absolutely. is really terrific. And I <clears throat> thanked her and I emailed her and she said, Dorothy, if you'd like to like to come and bring a, a group from your organization, we'll be happy to, ho I will be, I, Corey, will be happy to host them to come. And as a result, my husband and I have started watching the games, come to some and after all these 61 years, now we're got turning into um, women's basketball. Thanks. Yes. Thanks to Corey Close. No, thank you. This does a great job. Uh, Anne Marie. Anne Marie. Uh, 
first, just one comment. Uh, one of our other women's group, we had the pleasure of listening to your women's soccer coach. Yes, Marguerite. Uh, Marguerite was absolutely amazing. And she, one of the things she said is that when you hired her, you told her that you were not hiring her for what she could do in her first year on the job, but the potential she had four or five years from now. And then she turned around and won the national championship <laughs> <laughs> on her first year on the job. So we were just, my first head coach you hired. You to, yeah, so we were just laughing about you know, how high she raised the bar <laughs> for herself in her first year. So she's, she's delightful. The question I have is, we're joining the Big Ten, which is actually the Big 16. It's, 16 it's 14 schools, now, so 16 with us. So how is the scheduling going to be? I mean, we, we, we have seven football games a year. We're not going to play 16 teams. So they're going to have to rotate every other year. Have you started working on the schedule? So for the, for the fall sports, because this will be in 24, 25, they've started doing some of the scheduling for the fall sports. So like the men's soccer, women's soccer. Um, we just started joining the Big Ten meetings back in February for the first time. So they're at the beginning stage of that. The, the good thing is with the soccers, you know, we had to go through a process with the Board of Regents. And what we did was we estimated how much travel, how many games potentially based on schedules already in the Big Ten and stuff. The good thing is so far for the fall sports, it's less travel than what we were projecting to the regents. And what I mean is we told the regents, women's soccer, men's soccer, for example, we anticipate four away trips. So four times where you got to go to Michigan and play Michigan State, Michigan, you know, and actually it's going to be three, you know, so, so that's been a positive. And again, the travel thing gets a lot, of, a, a lot of airplay, but the reality is when you look at the whole totality of the schedule, it's not, it's not significantly more than what we do now. If you take four trips now and two of them, you're going to be two hours on each leg, you know, uh, the grand total is not significant when you talk about the whole course of the season. But that's been a positive that we've seen so far in those sports. With football, they're still working through that. I'm actually going Sunday. Uh, we, have, we have meetings Sunday night, Monday, and Tuesday on Mother's Day. So I've got to like, I'm going to try to cook breakfast with my girls and I hope they don't give their mother a hard time. And then I got to fly to Chicago. But one of the things we're going to talk about is the football scheduling because they've given some parameters, but they haven't given us exactly yet what it's going to look like. But we'll still have the same number of games. It's just, some might be going to Nebraska or, you know, Wisconsin coming here to play instead of Oregon State. So that's what it'll look like. Vicki. Okay, a few comments. First, actually, I'm usually too loud, so I try carefully. Um, Janelle McDonald has been amazing. She's the gymnastics coach. This was her first year. We hired her, yeah. Coming into a a tense situation. She has changed the culture so dramatically in one year. It's amazing. And they won the Pac-12. Finished fifth in the country. Hire, yeah, their hire, that hire was amazing and congratulations. Thank you. And number two, turning to basketball. Um, NIL, I had thought one reason we were doing this with the hope the kids would stay in school longer. Because if you look, for instance, we have a, a woman player in basketball, Charisma Osborne, who would have gone supposedly number five in the draft. She chose to come back here and play a fifth year because they really want to win, and this year they've got a team that has a good chance. Plus, NIL was an extra inducement. And I think, like Amari left after one year, but most of these kids, I think it is an extra inducement that they're not, they're making money mm -hmm. during college. So I think, you know, hopefully it will have a positive effect. And then in connection with that, is there any talk, there was years ago, at the NCAA about the one and done rule. Um, they, I, it's they, like, I hate, we all have, like, you have what these great players, Amari, and then off he goes, or Bona, if he goes, mm -hmm. and stuff. 
Um, is there any conversation going on at all about that? There was conversation. That's an NBA collective bargaining right. situation, and they they just came to a new deal, but that was that was dropped. The one and done was dropped, so it's going to stay the same. And um, you know that's that's just what it is. But I, I would say you, you know college is for all different types, different situations. You know I know we want to see our Bruins stay longer, but sometimes it's in their best interest to go if they can do that. You come to school to be able to do to chase professionally what your dream is. So I would say in that Amari example, if he you know gets good information, he feels confidently, and he goes to the NBA. You know that's that's what he he's chasing his dream. And we were a part of that process, and Coach Cronin and everybody else. He'll always be a Bruin. And, and so I think that's one where maybe in the past we've always wanted people to stay three, four, or five years. It's a different day now. Some, most will still do that, but some don't, but that's okay. I think, I think uh, you know, it's like that box of crayons, 64 colors, you know, there's, there's different flavors, different colors. And then lastly, I heard a rumor. <laughs> Oh gosh, Vicky. <laughs> Vicky, not the rumors. Uh oh. That when the Big Ten commissioner came here, he did some sort of deal that we may play very few, but like one or two maybe, basketball games off campus at other stadiums and things like that. Is that a complete rumor? That's a complete rumor. I haven't even heard that one, Vicky. I haven't heard that one. Okay. No. I hear yeah, I hear. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you. thank you, Carol. I know your name, Carol Block, ladies and gentlemen. I have to be careful what I ask. <laughs> <laughs> church and state. Church and state. <laughs> um, I know men's basketball, women's basketball, football are sort of you know always talked about. But we have such phenomenal athletes and things like women's golf, women's tennis, mm -hmm. um, even men's tennis, uh, rowing. How can we bolster those sports up? Because you just don't hear about them. Um, it's very hard to go and watch a women's golf game because they're usually at some golf course, you know, away from here. And, um, you know, you know, I like to bring women's, uh, like to bring staff to women's athletic events, but um, you need to do a better public relations mm -hmm. with the sports that we don't hear much about, and also trying to bolster those quiet sports up more. I mean, women's softball is getting, and gymnastics are getting, um, you know, we hear a lot about them, but these other sports, I think they need to be heard from, or you need to talk about them more. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, I would agree. Um, what you'll learn about me, I'm a straight shooter, so I'm going to tell you exactly what, what my thought is when you said that. I agree. I think it's a combination of we have to do more, and, and also um, others have to do more. And what I mean by that, I'm going to use women's soccer as an example. Uh, we never, I, I think you might have seen coming out here, we have signs up that, that show kind of the schedules. We usually do that for football, basketball, women's basketball. Uh, Rylan Turner texted me this past year and said, hey, why don't we ever have women's soccer on these marketing panels throughout campus? And I said, I don't know. But we met about it as a staff. We said, we should. Now. Part of the reason is those other ones are ticketed events that we're trying to bring in revenue, whereas that one is a lower ticketed item. That was, that was my marketing team's response. My response was, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So for the first time this year, we had women's soccer on those panels throughout campus. Um, hopefully that helped, but that's, that's an example of, of what you're saying is we need to change and evolve in how we promote and, and cover our sports. Uh, that said, I can tell you we spend a lot of time and energy, uh, women's basketball, for example, a couple other sports, and you know, at the end of the day, you're in LA, and, and the, the bandwidth is not always there. That's not an excuse, that's a reality. And so some of it is, uh, what I've tried to think about is how can our even student athletes and some of our staff 
ask people to come. I, I think peer-to-peer -peer asking is the best form of getting support. I think student athletes asking other students that they're sitting in class with and talking to them and engaging them and going to their plays and their recitals and doing, you know, that kind of thing. I don't think we talk about that enough. And that's something that I've talked with our coaches more about encouraging their student athletes to get involved with other, other students on campus. And I think you're going to get more support that way. Um, but your comment is right on. I, I, I think the challenging part for, for us is there are things we can do better and we've got to evolve. But also, too, when you put so much time and energy and resources, uh, because I used to be a marketing intern, and then you see the turnout, it's like, it's hard. It's deflating, and then you've got to make critical decisions about how you allocate your resources because you only have so many people and so much budget. So, we but I hear you. For, we have time for two more questions. Wow, this went fast. You guys have a lot of questions. Hi, can, can you guys hear me? It's hard to tell. <laughs> Okay, hi, I'm Claudia and I'm from Colombia. I used to be a member of the Female Hockey League in Colombia. Mm. And I have all my life rollerblader. Right now I have a broken toe, so it's oh, okay. Oh no. But uh, what my comment is, uh, one day I was chasing a girl who had a roller, US, UCLA rollerblade team or something, because I really wanted that t-shirt. By the way, how can I get one? And uh, she said that they were not available and I was crushed. But anyway, going back to that, if you guys have a rollerblading team, because I'm a fan, uh, maybe you should really push that a little bit more. And now that the Ciclavia is moving into other areas, you know, uh, I live in the valley, and not long ago they closed uh, Sherman Way, and it was packed. Uh, I know the Ciclavia in LA, I have heard other Ciclavias around the city, so perhaps UCLA could create their own Ciclavia and figure a way to bring the, the, the people and the community for, for us to, to always meet uh, these, these um, how I call, athletes. And if you have, if you uh, the Ciclavia right now is accepting bicycles and rollerblades, I'll be there on my skates. So I think that would be a good way to promote some of these sports, especially those that um, Madame said, they are very uh, obscured, because uh, I would love to be a member of the Royal Blade team. It's <laughs> a good Maybe thought. We should I'll organize take... an older group of hockey I'll players. I'll mean. share that with our marketing staff. I will, I will share that. Thank you. That's a good idea. Anyone, anyone have a final question? I love thoughts. Hi, my name is Jackie. This is my first time coming to me. Hi, Jackie. Hi. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, a uh, big sports fan, which is why I'm here today. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I thought about just what you said about um, student athletes asking people to come and watch what they do. And the only thought I had is my daughter is a first year, mm -hmm. not an athlete, but um, she's a musician. But her, you know, I listen when she talks to me about things, and her comment on that is, because she's really a big sports fan, she said she notices that, like, um, the sports guys, like, that she's been in class with, they all kind of stick together. Mm -hmm. And she said, like, her thought was, like, we went to a football game at the Rose Bowl, and it was pretty empty, and I remember I sent pictures to my family. And my sisters all went to OU, big sports, and you can't get a seat there. Like, it's right. packed. Mm -hmm. And my sister called me, and she's like, holy crap, Jack, that was, like, really empty. She said, this is UCLA football. So I was talking to my daughter about it, and I was talking to some of her friends about it. And they said, yeah, we don't go. We're not riding out there, and who's going to go watch those guys? And I started thinking, like, I think some of it is, like, the normal kids, as you would say, that aren't athletes sometimes feel like the athletes are unapproachable. And it's a, and maybe there is some about, you know, you want to invite people or you want to be friends with these guys. They're just people, right? Or the girls or, and yeah. I think sometimes they're so used to like, they're busy. Um, I train with the athletic, one of the athletic trainers for the basketball team myself. And so I do hear about a lot about men's basketball from him. And I think these guys are so busy and structured that sometimes when they're in class, they're just super focused. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I think if there's any way to bridge that gap and get students more excited, um, like I went to the University of Delaware back in the day and we did not have a good sports program. But I know our teams, like before the games, would literally, the football guys would have their jerseys on every Friday walking around campus with their jerseys engaging with students. Um, our hockey players did the same thing. 
And this was a long time ago, but it was a real community. And you started making friends with people. You wanted to go support them. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's something, I don't know, how you bridge that? Yeah, well, there, there are two ways you can bridge that. One is exactly what you said. Peer-to-peer yeah. -peer asking is the yeah. best, to me, is, is the best form. If your daughter felt more connected to... Yeah to her classmates that happen to be athletes, wh yeah. whatever program, she's more inclined to go. Yeah, and you know, that's nothing to... that I can do or a marketing right. team can do, right? Yeah. That's a natural. Yeah. And I think the second thing, uh, you know, you compared us to OU, the one thing you have to keep in mind with UCLA, we're one of three out of 65 Power Five schools yeah. Yeah. that have an off-campus stadium. No, I get that. That's far away. And that's tough. And it's so that's why, of... you know, if we were to ever have conversation or dialogue about a, 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 a campus stadium that would be closer right you know you i think you would have a different dynamic with with our football program and attending the the energy yeah i think, I think so. that's a that's a real challenge that we have to navigate i've heard so. troy aikman talk about that in fact i was at a thing at wasserman and i troy was standing next to me and i met him he's a lovely guy but i did hear him talking about that like if we had a you know closer campus or a co uh, football stadium and, you know, my daughter talks to I think Carol's daughter. taking notes right here. Or maybe more watch parties. Like, Sunday, I guess we do watch parties. Jackie, I would tell you we're doing a lot. You know, the reality is everybody thinks that you're going to do this or you do that. It's going to change. Yeah. It's, you know, it, we're not OU. Oh, right? No, We're not other, you I'm know. Not, I'm not no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying, I think, I think for us, like if I had my marketing team in here, they would, they would tell you 12,000 things they're doing I mean, to try to get more people, and then everybody's going to give them 12,001 and 12,002 ideas. Like it's really hard because at the end of the day, it's people making decisions about what they want to go attend, I mean, right? the kids aren't getting all the messages. Like, like, I don't know if there's a watch party. Like my daughter's signed up for everything, right? She doesn't hear a lot about what's happening. I mean, so sometimes I just think it's that. Just my thoughts. Yeah. Just try to help her. Because I love her. I mean, you can help by you coming. Tell your daughter to bring her and she comes. Well, and then maybe her friends will come. And then, everything. Okay. Everything. Well, make sure she goes. So she does. She's okay. the one that honestly told us to support the Wooden Fund. That's what made her do. That's on her. There we go. All right. Well, thank you for your time and your questions. I appreciate it. Hopefully, this was good. We brought a little bit of swag for athletics. Oh, yes. These custom-made uh, clear bags that will get into all of our athletic venues with whatever you need to bring. Uh, Betty has those in the back, so when you guys are done with uh, your business and all that, make sure you grab one of these on the way out. And you can bring it to all of our many venues when you bring a couple friends with you to uh, <laughs> the coming years. If you give yours away to a friend, I will replace you. it. Yes. If you lose it, I may not. <laughs> Thanks, Taylor. And most importantly, um, we'd like to take a moment to give a big thank you to Martin I mean, I don't know. for creating time from your very, 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 very busy schedule to share a moment, to share more information about UCLA athletics and the athletic department. And we'd also like to thank Taylor once again, um, our associate associate athletic director of development for his efforts to make the program happen. And I'll just say, I know it wasn't easy and uh, we really thank both of you for, for being here today. So with that, this ends our program portion.